Hi, everyone. I'm Srujana Kata, and I'm a DFO student at the OII. Um, to everyone online and in the room, welcome to this guest talk. We're delighted to have Dr. Sara Kasim here with us today to present her new book titled Work and Alienation in the Platform Economy, Amazon and the Power of Organization. Dr. Sara Kasim is a lecturer and research associate in political economy at the Department for Political Science at the University of Tübingen. Uh, her current teaching and research foci center around workers, working conditions, different forms of labor organization, and the intersectional dimensions of the labor movement. The presentation will run for around 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll follow that with a discussion at the end. Uh, if you're joining us online, please put your questions in the Q&A box and for everyone in the room, uh, save your questions until the ending, and then um, Sarah will answer the questions after her talk. Um, for your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted to the OII's website after the event. So it's great to have you, Sarah. Welcome, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to come here. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I was here four years ago for the summer doctoral program, so it's really interesting and quite a reflective moment for myself to be back here and uh, as things happen in life now I get to present my book which I'm really really excited about doing. Um, so as you've seen in the title uh, Amazon feature is quite prominent in the title and um, at the first impression it can seem like it's a book about Amazon which it is to a large extent. Now I took some screenshots of a few headlines that I came across over the last month just to really show you the, the variety we have of how Amazon pops up in the news. So if we start over here on the top left, you know, it's about, I chose this one because Amazon has been insisting so much on taking the brick and mortar stores and bringing them online. And we see also this reverse shift back into physical stores. Although I think this morning I read a headline about how they're closing up some of the Amazon Go stores. So you're seeing like, they're trying to keep up with the trends or also setting some trends then this headline I chose about Amazon deploying fleets of self-driving robo-taxis to show that Amazon is pretty interested in being at the forefront of technological developments and implementing these. This one I thought was very interesting because they're using the term Amazonification and we've, we're seeing also this term popping up more and more about like Amazonification of logistics, of production. It's almost like Tailorization, but based on Amazon, because they have a very clear, uh, let's say, division of labor in their own sense of system of efficiency. Now, the two last headlines here are related to uh, workers, worker strikes, resistance and agency, one from, from the country. Um, I When I started my research, uh, we didn't have strikes happening in the UK, and it was always really interesting to hear from GMB the struggles they're having in mobilizing people, and it's really nice to see that labor organization is happening in a lot of different places. So what's also really fun for me to do is whenever I give a talk, I wanna go back and take a look at the share prices at Amazon. The interesting thing is when I started uh, my dissertation, my PhD in 2016, it was somewhere over there. And around this time is really when Jeff Bezos, his wealth just multiplied. Around that time, we started seeing these headlines of being supposedly <laughs> The richest human being on earth etc and it's over here and then we see the pandemic hit and we can see how the share price just uh grew tremendously and of course now as we're seeing on the market there's a lot of uncertainty around platforms and technology and the investment going on there but this is just to show you know when we talk about the pandemic at least the first two years if we want to name so-called winners of the pandemic amazon would absolutely be on top of that list um, and we also see this reflected in their workforces. So this is from Statista, uh, where they present the numbers of employees at Amazon. Also very interesting, when I started my research in 2016, this is where, where we were at, and it already looked like it was growing exponentially. Now in hindsight, it looks like nothing compared to where we are. Um, and again, fascinating is with the pandemic, the workforce, this jump happened in the first six months. Uh, and this number does not account for seasonal workers, which is a huge thing when we talk about Amazon warehouses, because uh, the workforce at an Amazon warehouse can double during the peak season, which is Black Friday to Christmas. And this is not included here, also not subcontracted workers. So in a way, we can assume that the workforce is much higher. 
again, it will be interesting to see how what this will mean uh, with the moment of crisis that we're living in now that we see there are job cuts also happening at Amazon. But in a way, in one way or the other, we can see that Amazon is growing, um, has been growing. We can also say that Amazon's ecosystem is so large. So you may be ordering off Amazon. You may not order off Amazon, but I would say it's incredibly difficult to completely uh, avoid Amazon, especially when we take a look at Amazon Web Services and everything that's running over Amazon Web Services. So this brings me to today's talk, which is I'd like to start off by really reflecting a bit on what motivated my research, what is my research about, what was my starting point, and then really dive into the core cases of my research, which is comparing, now I always reference the Amazon warehouses, but what I'm doing is comparing the Amazon warehouses along with Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, and then taking that step back and recontextualizing that work. So in terms of the motivations, I come from political economy and I'm really interested in, you know, changes happening in uh, ca our capitalist system. And by that, I mean to really understand the conditions that we live in in a dialectal, dialectical way, meaning a change in one element will result in changes in others. They can be contradictory in the sense that um, if we want to take a, a look at contemporary developments, you know, with the platform economy, we have that change in technological developments, right? We have the dissemination of the internet, the internet growing, more access. And with that access, we also have a deregulation of the labor market so that, you know, you could there's a degree of normalization of precarious contracts, as we know. And in a way, we also have that people are more excited about investing on the stock market. And all of these elements coming together, in my opinion, bring about different moments in the platform economy and different moments in our economy. So in terms of this project, I was really interested in studying a contemporary development on the labor market. And that was the platform economy to me at the time. And uh, in my research, I really take a labor centered focus. So I come from political economy and I think it's really important to contextualize things, to know the conditions that are, what are we talking about? What is this context? Because through the context, we can also understand sort of possibilities, but also challenges. And by fo focusing on labor, rather than taking a structuralist perspective saying, these are the conditions, so that's the way it is. By bringing in labor's agency, we can focus on, you know, what can be done about it? And what do the people that are affected by this do about it? So um, there's been so much work that's been published in recent years, so much work stemming from this institute itself. And uh, I hope now with my book that I can be among this scholarship. And on the one hand, there's a lot of work related now increasing around the Amazon warehouses. Uh, Sabrina Apicella did amazing work, in my opinion, maybe even the first person to take a look at the Amazon warehouses. She took a look at the warehouses in Germany and started going out there and talking to workers. Why do you strike and why do you not strike to understand the motivations? And this was back in like 2016 before Amazon was what it is now, monopolizing complete markets. Um, we have more and more books being published on Amazon warehouses which in my opinion are part of the platform economy as an e-commerce platform. So we can kind of contextualize that work around these kinds of books about the platform uh, capitalism or digital monopolies, because as we know, Amazon is monopolizing markets. But then as a lot of work that comes out of this institute, a lot of it is still related to the gig economy and uh, precarious work in gig, on gig, gig platforms. So essentially, the starting point for my research is the platform economy isn't uniform. So how can we approach it then? What are elements kind of, if we needed to identify different characteristics, what would they be? And I obviously build on the research of so many others in saying that there's two important elements, the nature of the platform, meaning am I location-based? So do I have to be physically at the workplace? For me, this example is the Amazon warehouses. I have to be at the warehouse to work and, uh, or are you web-based, which would be the Amazon Mechanical Turk worker. I can work from anywhere in the world. I just have to log on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Then comes the nature of the work, which means so much focus is on the gig economy. You're paid by, uh, by task. But then there's the other side, 
which is at the warehouse in the Google offices where you kind of what I call just a traditional time wage. You're paid by the hour. You go to the warehouse, you more or less know how much you're going to make at the end of the day because this is set. Now, based on that, um, if we go back to that political economy perspective, we can see that these dimensions didn't develop in a vacuum. So if we take a look at the platform economy, this is kind of like a timeline all right, that I've created. Uh, we have the dot-com boom in the 90s, and then we have kind of what I refer to as first-generation platforms. Amazon, Google, eBay, Yahoo fall under this category. And they, were, they didn't do something extremely new on the labor market. The idea was, okay, we're selling something online, but the workers that were working for warehouses or in a storage somewhere, essentially, it was quite similar to, you know, now is still quite similar to factory work, we could say. Um, so this is quite traditional and location based. Then as we, as the different conditions that, we, that I've mentioned developed, we also had in this phase then web-based platform happening with Amazon Mechanical Turk, for instance. So now you have the introduction of web-based work, but you also have for the platform economy, this gig, uh, gig wages being introduced. However, it's really after the last crisis of 2008, well, the 2008 crisis, that we really see the gig economy being normalized and booming. So in a way, we can say that it started here, but it's really disseminating in, into society over here. So essentially what I'm doing in my book is trying to understand how do these different dimensions, what are their implications at the end of the day? And the way that I phrase this in a question is how does the different nature of the platform, so location-based and web-based, and how does the different nature of work, meaning whether you get a traditional time wage or a gig wage, alienate workers, but also how does it affect their agency? Um, and for that, Amazon was a perfect example. So by doing so, I would say that this book is about Amazon, which is a growing, growing corporation. It has a growing ecosystem. Once you dive into Amazon, it's really scary where they have their hands. Um, when we also think about what it means, the implications for the logistics chain, when Amazon has control from the very first step until delivery, for example, and what this means for delivery workers as well, who are gig workers in many cases. Um, so there's that importance, but also if you wanna take a look at the platform economy, by taking the example of the Amazon warehouses and the Amazon Mechanical Turk, we have each of the four elements I just mentioned. We have the web-based, we have the location-based, we have the gig wage, and we have the time wage. And by having that kind of systematic approach, we can start understanding how does that nature of, uh, of platform, so the fact that I'm location-based, how does that affect me being alienated at work, but also how does it affect maybe the opportunities I have, but also the challenges I have if I want to organize and so forth. So. Now we're going to dive in to the work itself. Um, the work, as you've now heard, the comparison of the Amazon warehouse workers and the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers is both based on uh, field work. In the case of the Amazon warehouse workers, this is based on um, striking with the workers, based on interviewing workers individually, but also in groups, based on being uh, visiting the warehouse and also attending union meetings, both on a national level. So in the case, in this case, it's Germany. So attending uh, union meetings of Verdi, but also attending uh, some of the union meetings that are happening in, happening internationally by Uni Global Union. So there's also that transnational dimension, whereas the access to Amazon Mechanical Turk, I would not say that I did anything quite innovative there, but followed from other researchers the idea to uh, to post instead of interviewing to post as tasks um, online and to do some tasks myself. So, in terms of the theoretical framework, because research is never a theoretical, and the the theoretical lens that we put on affects obviously the world we're seeing and the implications of that in analysis. Um, as you can tell from the title, I'm very interested in alienation. And uh, at the time I was almost quite obsessed by this concept and I started seeing it. Now you see it popping up more and more in media. And I think it's great. It's great for my book and it's being normalized. Um, but then the question is, how do you study alienation? I did not want it to wanna get, uh, come from a psychological approach. Like I didn't wanna provide surveys and say, please let me know how alienated you feel. <laughs> I don't feel as a researcher, I'm in, in, in any place to make that kind of judgment. Um, and it's not a quantitative kind of work. 
And uh, what I found quite useful to the analysis was actually going back to Marx, his economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. When I was doing my PhD, my supervisors were like, oh, come on, Soto, why are you going back to this text of 200 years ago? How is this useful? <laughs> I still think it is useful. And actually, um, it's really a, a helpful tool to systematically analyze alienation. So what do we actually mean by that? How can we uh, study it? And the way to do so is Marx speaks of four relations, essentially one to the labor activities. Too. So what does it mean in terms of what kind of work I'm doing, then to labor's product, the, the thing I'm creating or contributing to species being is a way of saying, what about my life outside of work and how work comes to dominate all these different aspects of my life? that I feel alienated from the things that would normally fulfill me, for instance. And then fellow humans is how do I perceive other people? Um, and you know, under in our capitalist system, I always, the example I give when, when I teach my students is uh, when you get to know someone, it's very likely that the first question you ask them is, what do you do? And by that, it's we're basically asking each other, what do you, what's your work? And in a way, this is also, um, an embodiment of how work comes to consume our existence and how we may perceive other people as workers, but also sometimes as competition. And now the idea is by studying these different dimensions, I can take a look at the shop floor level, understand the working conditions, understand how work can fragment the workforce. But then I really wanna get at this, which is how do workers actually mobilize? Because in my opinion, if I only did this analysis, as much as I think it's essential, Stopping here is actually, uh, I think, fundamentally dangerous because if you stop here, then we're stripping people of their agency. We're saying, you know what, you're so alienated, you can't do anything about it. And I think that is incredibly dangerous. And so we need to see, because under capitalism, we are alienated in our work. However, we have seen historically resistance does happen. And an essential common uh, conception or concept for that, for this link between okay, we're alienated, but we still organize, can be something like class consciousness. But class consciousness, to me, does not negate uh, racialized or gendered subjectivity. So, for example, at the Amazon warehouses, we do see people coming together. Uh, in the US, the, one of the first walkouts was because uh, in Minnesota, they wanted extra time to pray during Ramadan. And these were East African workers, and they came together because they had that subjectivity, that material reality, and that basis for solidarity. So in a way we go then, we take a step back from the shop floor level, level, take a look at the context and take a look at how do workers organize. But again, the question, how do we conceptualize that? How am I studying this organization? And this is based on the power resources approach, meaning on the one hand, the structural power. So what is my leverage on the labor market? We know if I can get all trains to stop running on a day, the leverage I have is much higher than perhaps someone who decides I'm not doing a task on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So that's the structural power, my leverage and my ability to disrupt work. The associational refers to more classically unions, forming associations, possibly in the form of unions, institutional power, you know, what kind of rights do I have institutionalized in the workplace? Do I have a works council, a collective bargaining agreement? And the societal power is really, how can I take my worker struggle and broaden it to get society on board? This can be discursively. So more and more people are talking about, for example, the essential workers during COVID. That was, in my opinion, quite the high moment uh, for discursive power for essential workers, but also finding new coalitions. So as workers, we're starting to reach out to journalists, to social movements, to NGOs, to really broaden the, the labor movement. So this is kind of the template I'm coming with. And now I wanna study this in relation to the Amazon warehouses and Amazon Mechanical Turk. Now this quote is a quote that I was, uh, whenever I was interviewing workers, there's many workers that would give me the exact quote, I am not a robot. Actually this quote of I am not a robot uh, in a different way is used now nationally and transnationally to organize workers at Amazon. Amazon, we are not robots is their slogan in many cases. Um, now, if we took a look at now the alienation of workers at the warehouse, how, what does this de facto look like? Um, on the one hand, we can see this very clear division of labor, this hyper tailorization happening. So warehouse workers don't produce items, they circulate them. Someone somewhere is ordering an item. And then it's almost as if it's going through a production line, but I just call it circulation line, meaning 
one worker will have access to the product coming in, will scan it, then it moves on to the next worker who will take it and has to stow it somewhere in a, in a, on a shelf, then comes the next worker who has to go and pick the item, and then comes the next worker who has to pack it. Now, these are the four essential steps, but there's also variations there. And the idea is that workers are saying, I'm not a robot because essentially they are, um, let's say, the, the nature of the labor is very alienating. You do feel like you are running the Amazon machine. Everyone has to do the exact step that they're assigned. And the other aspect to it is obviously the technological surveillance happening because they have a units per hour rate. So depending on uh, where you are in that circulation line, you have to stick to a specific number. So for example, if I'm a picker, so I'm going around to pick up items, how should we imagine this? So in Germany, the rates that I was uh, exposed to, at least through my interviews, was 100 to 120 uh, per hour. So that means we're talking about two items per minute. I don't know about you, but when I first heard this, I felt like that was <laughs> that was a lot. If you're going to do this, two items per minute, every minute of every hour, <laughs> every hour of every working day, and that over the course of a week, that is a lot. However, in the union meetings, then I heard that people in Poland, and by the way, the warehouses in Poland were initially and primarily opened for the German market because Germany is the largest market for Amazon outside of the US or has been until now, UK is in close competition there. Um, and the German warehouses are there, uh, sorry, the Polish warehouses are there for the German market where they get a fraction of the wage. Um, and there their UPH was 240. And then there were stories coming out of the US where the number was 400. So you can go back and calculate what that means in terms of a minute. And apparently these numbers are uh, you know, calculated objectively and so forth. But there is a degree of uh, the surveillance that happens. And to me, this picture really sums up the alienation very well, because this is a slogan that is in the warehouse, work hard, have fun, make history. This is what workers are exposed to when they go in to work at the warehouse. Uh, and also something to keep in mind, these warehouses, I say warehouses, they're not called warehouses at Amazon, they're called fulfillment centers, because you're there to fulfill the customer. So there's so much of so many elements to really systematically study then. How does that come together? How is that expressed? And in a way, there are workers who uh, identify with Amazon. There's workers who might feel that they're alienated, but the point is that there are also workers who do organize. And the way that they organize comes about in a lot of different ways. And this is why the fact that they receive a time wage and that they are location-based has a huge role uh, on how they organize because in the most obvious way, you're subject to the law where you are located. So workers in one country might find it much easier to go on strike than in another country, for instance. Um, depending on your country, you could have a fixed uh, contract or you could have a permanent contract. In Germany, for example, we know that workers are most likely to unionize and go on strike as soon as they get a permanent contract, which is under German law. Can um, After two years, Amazon has to decide, are you staying permanent? or are we letting you go? They can't keep up uh, a fixed contract for longer than two years. And we see that workers will go on strike if they want to, once they hit those two years and they become permanent because then Amazon cannot uh, apply its uni union busting tactics like it does in the US and Germany. So this is a picture of the German union, Vadi, the service union going on strike. It's like a play on the work hard, have fun, make history, work fair, have fun, make tarif vertrag. Tarif vertrag means collective bargaining agreement. Um, Germany has the oldest labor struggle at Amazon. Uh, however, it is still unsuccessful until now, unfortunately. So they've been pushing for a collective bargaining agreement according to the logistics, sorry, according, according to the retail industry. Uh, Amazon says it's not necessary because we're already paying above minimum wage and we're already paying uh, according to the logistics because they perceive themselves as a logistics company. But in an interesting way, once you go somewhere else in the world, Amazon will say we are a retail company. So the thing about Amazon is it will always, in a way, because it's location based, it will, you know, play with the, it will basically use the national context and instrumentalize that for its own interests. So as much as we're studying agency of warehouse workers and what are their possibilities, many of the challenges that come can also be precisely because of their context and they can be precise because within that context, Amazon has a specific leeway. As you may know, through the case of the US 
where you know they resort to union busting activities that would just be straight up illegal in a country like Germany. So we have all of this analysis on one hand, again, because of the location-based and time wage. And then on the other hand, we have the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers that are web-based and paid by gig. So now the question is, how do those two dimensions affect their alienation and how they mobilize? This is also a quote from one of the surveys, which I think uh, really sums it up very well. I can work when I want and not work when I want. Um, <laughs> I took a screenshot of a task. I went online last week. I was just curious what's, what are tasks that are being posted. And this was one of them. Tell us what this item is. So as you may know from Amazon Mechanical Turk, the tasks are called human intelligence tasks. And this was one of them. Um, surprisingly, I didn't even qualify for that task, though. Uh, when I logged on, apparently I only qualified for two tasks. Um, in this specific uh, case, this task was also only paying eight, uh, eight cents. Now, the idea with Amazon Mechanical Turk is that alienation will look fundamentally different because you're now laboring online, meaning in the process of your labor activity, you're neither exposed to your fellow workers. So this is different to the Amazon warehouses. It's not like you're going to the bathroom and you run into a fellow worker. That doesn't happen. And you don't really know much about the person posting the task online. So this person who posted, what, what is this item? I have no idea who this person is because they're... Uh, their name on Amazon Mechanical Turk was also anonymized. So it was just a code of random letters and, and numbers. Um, so you don't actually even know for what purposes you're producing what you're producing. And uh, in this case, we know it's data, but for whom? What is the purpose? And this also will have implications then later in terms of organizing and mobilizing. For example, uh, if you're in an Amazon warehouse, when you're hired, you're hired as an warehouse associate, which means you can do all of the steps along the whole circulation line. So they can shift you around. Today, you're a picker. Next week, you're a packer, for instance. If you're in Germany, uh, one way to kind of punish you for going on a strike is to put you on picking because it's the most exhausting task because you're going back and forth to shelves, whereas other ones you're standing. But the idea is you have an understanding of the different steps along the division of labor, which can be impactful when you're striking. In this specific case, you have no idea. You have no idea what the division of labor is to, to begin with because you don't know what's the first one, you don't know what's the last step, and you don't know what your contribution, this, let's say the implications of your contributions in the specific case. And obviously this then has an effect on the species being because whereas in a warehouse, there's a limit, there's just a set limit to the working hours you have every day because you're bound to the space as obvious as it sounds. In this specific case, we know that work uh, encroaches onto the home that these temporal and spatial boundaries don't exist in that way and will also affect then your relation to fellow humans, maybe in this specific case, workers online. However, as we also know for Amazon Mechanical Turk, they do express their agency, but it looks fundamentally different than the Amazon warehouse workers. And this is why this comparison, in my opinion, is quite fruitful because it shows that if we're going to raise the larger questions of what what does our labor movement look like? What does a possible labor movement look like? Um, I think we see quite the variety from, you know, unionizing, top-down unions, grassroots unions, as we know, coming out of a country like the U.S. with Amazon Labor Union, um, but also in alternative ways that are beyond maybe traditional unions. Because when I asked uh, workers about their opinions about unions, so many were like, why do I need a union in the first place? They don't represent me. And I think in many parts of society, we can actually see that people don't identify with unions. However, we could also argue that right now there is a reshift to that, uh, but that's up for discussion. And the thing that's really interesting is, although Amazon Mechanical Turk workers fundamentally different to the warehouse workers, they don't have high leverage on the labor market. If you go on, it's the idea is through this web-based nature, the competition is international. The conception that we have of the effectiveness of a strike changes. And we see this also in the gig economy. But then again, even if we're talking about the gig economy, the fact that, for example, riders are location-based, it changes again, the possible significance of a strike. And that's why I say that these different natures of uh, platforms and different natures of work are so interesting to study. Um, when we talk about the organizing of workers, I do shift away from understanding resistance purely as unions. I also didn't mention this right now, but 
in the analysis, I'm very curious about everyday forms of resistance. And what becomes clear is because of the increased surveillance that goes on in the platform economy, and that these platforms are trendsetters when it comes to algorithmic management and surveillance in general, everyday forms of resistance, as we know historically, like working slower, become close to impossible. Mm. Um, so in an Amazon warehouse, you can do it, you'll be labeled an underperformer, literally called an underperformer then. So, and this will affect the possibility of it getting that extension of a contract if you still need it. Um, but in this specific case of Amazon Mechanical Turk, we know that they instrumentalize online digital spaces to then communicate with one another. In my opinion, this is a, a moment of solidarity because in the end, you could be perceiving each other as competition. Like, why am I giving advice to other people for how to best navigate Mechanical Turk if I can use that knowledge for myself to get a higher wage? But in effect, we see that there are these, uh, this was one also screenshot of just last week, uh, on Reddit about how to best navigate this. So if we're gonna take a step back again, I just wanna highlight the importance of here comparing the different cases, because on the one hand, then we can analyze the shop floor level in terms of Amazon warehouses, it's really the warehouse, but also the digital shop floor level in the, um, in the example of Amazon Mechanical Turk. And by studying the relations of alienation, you know, we can study the working conditions. It's a systematic way to study the working conditions and uh, the individualization that happens there. By then, and in the same time, by looking at these different dimensions, we can really identify the role of each dimension when it comes to this. And if we take a look at the power resources, we're able to study, again, the possibilities, but also the challenges and about the role of the context, because, now I was highlighting how much the Amazon warehouse workers are tied to their local context in terms of the laws and so forth. But of course, the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers are not uh, you know, disconnected from their own material conditions, but are very much embedded in their own political economic context and so forth. So even when we have uh, the platform directive you know, being discussed and so forth, I'm always wondering, well, what will that mean for workers in the global South? Even if we're able to achieve this in Europe, what about uh, areas where we don't have a minimum wage actually applied or you don't have the right to organize and so forth. And by doing so, we can then take a step back and understand the implications for the labor market. And then we can also understand the implications for the labor movement. So as I said, with the cases of Amazon or with the case with this book is we can talk about Amazon. We can talk about the variety of the platform economy in doing so we can understand agency, but of course, also, where do we start with regulation? What does regulation look like for different platforms? And then also we can reflect on the labor movement at large, because in my opinion, I think so much like if, you, if you're interested in labor today and labor organizing and the labor movement, the platform economy is great because there's so much going on. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's quite inspiring. So I'd just like to end with this uh, uh, quote from the book, just as the conditions of the platform economy need to be understood historically and holistically, so too does the agency of workers. The form and appearances by which workers express this agency similarly co-evolve with the material and technological conditions, both of the platforms and of the larger political economic context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I will open the floor for questions. I think we're, we're we're still waiting for some questions on the from the online participants, but if anyone in the room wants to jump in with any questions, sure, please. So I'm really curious about your. Um, I'm doing my thesis also on um, platform economy and labor, but um, you mentioned that you had spent a lot of time with them and interviewed participants, and so I'm just kind of curious what your like um, strategy was going in, given like the positionality of a researcher and the precarity of this nature of work. Like if you kind of have any, I don't know, not tips, but like, how did you think about approaching that kind of qualitative research? That and if sense. I could add to that question, um, so doing this field work being like a young female, like how do you approach that? Because I think that this is also like very important when you are doing um, this kind of field work. Um, I, you can take that. I have a question that's somewhat related, so I'll just tack it on to the end there. <laughs> um, I was just also wondering that you did a lot of uh, your field work in, with unions and um, in industrial actions and in various strikes. 
So I was wondering how you kind of navigate the boundaries between your role as a researcher and your role as an ally to workers. And if, if there are places where you shouldn't be overstepping or where you can extend your solidarity without while you know continuing to be faithful to what you need to do as a researcher. Great question. Um, yeah, thank you so much for these great questions. Uh, I would be lying to say it was a straightforward process of, uh, of the research and uh, accessing the field. I think um, in the case of Amazon Mechanical Turk, because of the web-based nature in and of itself, that element of being a young female and a woman of color just nobody knows about, right? I mean, I do say that this is a survey, obviously, and for what purposes and et cetera, but uh, it's just not visible, right? Um, the access to the Amazon warehouses, yes, that was, uh, I think the way that, I, well, I think there's different ways to accessing the field. In my specific case, I was doing my PhD in Germany, so it made the most sense. Um, I also speak German, so the language was not there as a barrier. And um, in this specific case, I gained access actually through the union itself. So it was more kind of a gatekeeping situation where uh, someone introduced me to someone at the union. And then, and the reason that this is important is by doing so, the union realizes you're on their side, which is important. Otherwise, they will not, because these meetings are strategy meetings. They're discussing when should we strike and how should we do it. So to let a researcher in on when is a strike happening before it happens is huge. Uh, so there has to be a degree of trust there. And in this specific case, it came through that. So I kind of got sort of the green light through the union. In terms of uh, what was really interesting, and I didn't talk about it right now, is obviously the Amazon warehouse workers the labor market is obviously also racialized and gendered depending on where the warehouse is. Warehouses tend to be in areas with higher than average uh, unemployment because they can sort of hire people and this affects again their agency. Um, but the fact that I was actually a woman of color helped so much in the interviews because uh, I'm really happy that you mentioned this so I can actually talk about this. In a way, it was uh, to me, the, like I find them inspiring and uh, I think I'm trying to show solidarity through my work and in many cases they were speaking to me out of solidarity to me because they were like you know what you're a young woman maybe you know I come from Egypt so they were maybe North Africans we were speaking Arabic and they'd be like we want to elevate your voice as a an, um, young North African for example and then based on that they would trust me and then it happened in a different moment just a few months ago where there was a new strike happening at a warehouse that where there was never a strike in Germany. And uh, I reached out to this worker over Twitter. Twitter is great in these things. And uh, when we spoke, uh, he actually prioritized speaking to me over the German media because he said, you know, we have to stick together in this. So sometimes precisely being a woman or precisely being a woman of color was actually that foundation for the interviews and what they would say in interviews. So, so many times they told me, you know what, if I was speaking to someone else right now, I wouldn't be telling them this, but I'll tell you this. There's a degree of trust and solidarity happening there. I think there was definitely as a researcher, there was a degree of intimidation by being a young woman in the room. And also where I definitely struggled is how to treat workers then as subjects and not, they are the object of my PhD analysis now, and I'm just looking at them and studying them. So this was also for myself constant, um, like you're just undergoing a constant process of reflection and reflecting on your own positionality and also being honest about where you are on that. Um, some researchers I know that were looking at Amazon warehouses would then go and work at Amazon warehouses. This is, for example, something that I did not want to do because I wanted the intentions kind of to be clear from the beginning. I'm speaking to you because I'm doing research um, with this intention. And then based on that, people can decide do you know, like whether they want to talk to me or not. Cool. We have a couple of questions online. Um, the first one's from Ingrid uh, Ipur, or Ipur, Ipur, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, she asks, can you speak a bit more on how the work conditions and alienation levels differ in Amazon fulfillment centers today, as opposed to historical assembly lines and factory work? 
That is a that is a great question, <laughs> and uh, it's a popular question, I must say. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure how much I would say it differs or it must differ. In a way, I would say that uh, Amazon is like that work, but brought into the 21st century. And the fact that they are also working on technology means they will be at the forefront of implementing that technology within the warehouses. And that's where that element comes in. So this can be in a process to make um, the work more efficient, the turnaround of the products in the warehouse faster. Um, it can also mean as much the working conditions as as much the surveillance. And the surveillance, again, obviously affects um, the working conditions. In Amazon, they can see the time off task. So basically, if I am gone from the task for two minutes, they can see that and they can see how often that is happening. So you can really follow uh, the whole workflow of a worker. Um, and that, in turn, is going to have effects on the forms of resistance. Uh, because resistance can also be for some workers that they decide to talk to their coworker because also how do you build solidarity in a warehouse? You need to speak to each other. And that's also, let's say an opportunity of being under the same roof, like in a factory. So that's where I would say, um, and also Amazon, the way it instrumentalizes the national context, I would not say the warehouse are so much different than um, production work. Like if we take a look at car production in Germany, it's nothing new that you open up plants in other countries such as Poland. Um, so I would say, you know, <laughs> corporations also learn from each other. And uh, with Amazon, we have that added dimension of technology. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I guess kind of related to the other, well, first of all, thank you so much for this talk. That was really great. Related to the other kind of questions, really appreciate the care that you put into all this work. And I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit more about how you approach both alienation and agency intersectional. At various points, you already hit the really interesting things, but I want to hear you talk more about particularly, you know, warehouse workers are united by these various work conditions, but each worker will have differential access to different resistance tactics. I have no, about, I have no idea about German laws, but for example, someone in a more precarious position in society might be more wary about participating in more visible strikes or refusals, especially in visa sponsorship situations and so forth. Um, for some people, existence is resistance. So how do you kind of deal with this mess? The same with the kind of Amtrak side. You know, it sounds really difficult not knowing about the workers and where they're situated, jurisdictionally especially. Um, I think a lot of labor scholars who work on non-Western contexts are like this, you know, in Hong Kong, for example, um, the informal workforce is likely much larger than the formal workforce. How do you contend with that? And this affects the kind of layers of agencies that you like clearly laid out. You're right in identifying it as a mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would start off by trying to maybe be like humble in uh, what this book is and what it also isn't, right? There's only so much you can do. And also I understand uh, through the process of reworking this and publishing it, I understood so much of the, this almost, uh, it, for me, it was a struggle of, this is a project I started seven years ago. And uh, in the process, trying to more and more update it with how I felt and see the world today and, and labor and agency and resistance, you know, uh, even we are like, just like capital and labor mo located in a single moment in time and space, so are we as researchers. So um, I think, in a way, if I went back and wrote this book, I would probably have written it differently. However, the way I tried to approach it is by understanding in the case of Amazon. So on one hand, this alienation and agency. As much as, so I'm very committed to the importance of alienation, but as a researcher, it's incredibly difficult to balance it with agency because you have to, you know, uh, we have quotes, historical quotes, where workers are compared with, uh, you know, trained gorillas, Taylor. Um, and so you don't want to say that's the case, right? You want to bring back the agency and the class consciousness and the subjectivity. So that was a challenge to, uh, to investigate. And that's why I tie it to the working conditions. And I don't say this is a study of how I say class consciousness is important and so is subjectivity, but I'm not measuring them. I don't see myself as a position to measure and I don't want to make any claims about that. 
Um, that's one thing. In terms of the intersectional dimensions, I think uh, in a way I used, for example, in the case of the warehouses, my access point was Germany. Um, but Amazon, in a way, likes to export the way it organizes workers more or less the same across the world. So workers would tell me, you could enter a warehouse across the world. It would kind of like, I compare it to IKEA. You can enter it. It's more or less going to be organized the same way. Um, and this lingo of work hard, have fun, make history, this would, you would find the exact words not translated in a German warehouse. So the person is speaking German with you, but then they say work hard, have fun, make history. So there's this <laughs> idea of the Amazonian culture being exported. Now, the idea where it becomes important what the what the let's say material realities of the workers is precisely the fact that amazon when it comes to warehouses it's a race to the bottom we're seeing more and more they're hiring whoever will, is willing to do the job in the us there was a leak last summer saying they think they're going to run out of workers eventually for the warehouses in the case of germany i can tell you during the course of the of the research itself it's been so interesting to observe i remember in tubingen where i am sometimes over close to the Christmas time before COVID, they were advertising for warehouse jobs in the cafeteria of the university. So they wanted students. Students are great for this job. You're hired, you get a job for a few months, and you're not going to be interested maybe in organizing because you know you're only hired for six weeks at Amazon. And that affects the agency because if that's the time when you have the highest leverage because the most orders are coming in, but you have people on precarious contracts, this is going to affect how do you mobilize people? In Germany, this one time, this warehouse that um, that went on strike for the first time in September because of inflation, actually. So this is how the political economic conditions now affect it. He told me they have over 90 languages spoken at this one how warehouse. How do you organize people of over 90 languages? Because they managed to. And it was because of the different backgrounds of workers. It was very, very like beautiful and organic because what happened in instead of a German, a white German union is coming in and saying, we're organizing now, we're striking now. The workers spoke in their own communities. So someone from Ghana was organizing the people from Ghana. Someone who was Syrian was organizing everyone who was speaking Arabic. So you had these kind of like pockets of solidarity. And based on that, they were able to strike and actually to the point where um, the managers had to go and pack the items because that's how strong the strike was. And this didn't make it to the media in that way because Amazon also has its own PR campaigns and so forth. So, but in that specific case, the fact that you uh, perhaps are a migrant worker affects it because your residence permit in Germany is tied to your employer. So in a way, you will have to leave the country if you lose your job. And that's why they organize once they have the permanent contract because by law, you have the right to association and the right to strike. Um, so you have these different dimensions playing a role. But at the same time, those dimensions can keep you from striking because um, they told me that these are workers who are sending money back home. And now with uh, you know currency devaluations everywhere in the world, if you are, because in Germany you pay union dues. So instead of paying that 1% of your wage, you're sending it to your family because that's more important to you. And in that moment, they say, we don't force them. We don't pressure them. We tell them go in and work because we know this is important for your family. So it's really in those moments where you see sort of uh, the intersectional dimensions coming to the foreground, but you're absolutely right in the end when it comes to MTurk, you know, on the survey, they, they can answer how they identify uh, and some answer and, and some don't. And you have these numbers, but research has shown more and more that there's being actually a gender balance depending on, on where you're looking. And I think for the MTurk, and I didn't do it to be completely honest, but it would be important to go into the local context because you're absolutely right. It makes a difference once you see whether the formal employment is higher in a country or the informal. And also what are the rights of the workers there, you know, um, whether to, uh, to unionize and stuff. But I do think that there is a degree of solidarity that happens if they say, I found out about Amazon Mechanical Turk through my family. So you're also coming in with your gendered and your racialized backgrounds uh, or material realities and uh, in the same way, how you work. So they keep popping up and uh, they do play a role in the end. Um, let's take go, one go. question yeah. from the online participants and then we'll come back to the room. Um, you talked a lot about kind of organizing in the in the warehouse and everything. So this question about organizing over social media might also be something to touch on as a related thing. Um, the person asked, how does organize, Sayali asks, how does organizing over social media affect workers in warehouses versus MTurk? If you notice anything about that in your research. 
I think the fact that MTurk is web-based means that sort of the, the, the fabric of communication is by default digital. And in a way, we know that social media plays a role. Um, sometimes you find out about the jobs through social media, and maybe you are in touch with other people, you know, through social media or through a platform. Um, I think in the case of the warehouses, it can be helpful. It is used, you know, workers can have WhatsApp groups, they can have Facebook groups, but at the same time, it's not essential. It's not, it's not that you can, because they're location-based and in the, different to gig workers, because they have the traditional, traditional time wage, they're going every day to the same warehouse. Sometimes the warehouse is located outside and you have to take the same bus. And on that bus, you can talk. In that break, you can speak and you can form solidarity. So that face-to-face -face can be essential. And we've seen that in, uh, in warehouses. So in a way, I would say when it comes to warehouses, it can complement sort of the resistance and the agency, whereas because of the web-based nature, it's by definition more centered around also social media then. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's also very interesting because we're, uh, even in this department, there's so much work being done about social media and the role it plays in uh, labor organizing, um, but it obviously depends entirely on the kind of um, you know, working conditions that structure their lives. Um, would you have, um, I'm sorry, someone in the back. Yes. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for your talk. Um, I'm wondering, are there any policy implications or recommendations you came up with after your findings? And not only policy recommendations, maybe also implications to Amazon, to the union, to workers, um, yeah, I have to say that uh, when when I first uh, approached this, I was very like on the labor center, like approach, and I realized that also writing the book, it's like, okay, so what are people are always interested? So what are the, what are your recommendations and or where do you think policy should go or what should they tackle? I think with the case of Amazon, you have so many you know, um, areas to tackle. And I hint at that in the conclusion then. On the one hand, you know, Amazon is monopolizing markets and there's a question there around the implications of just the sheer political, economic and societal power and technological power within a single corporation. We've seen that with different politicians, especially in the US saying that we need to break up Amazon. It's not okay. It's not, it should not be the case that Amazon holds so much uh, power in the first place. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, at least, you know, the implications are more because they're location based. So if you want to tie it to a country, it's more obvious in the case of a warehouse. And this is also part of the point of why we need to talk about the different dimensions. Um, in case of the, the warehouses, these are sometimes subsidized. So, uh, you know, there's been reports by Uni Global Union about how many millions of dollars have been uh, paid by the state essentially to have a warehouse open somewhere or an Amazon office somewhere. Um, so that's a question to be asked. Uh, at the same time, we know about the lack of taxes, let's say, when it comes to platforms and Amazon is at the top of that list. When a worker tells you it should not be the case that I'm paying more taxes than Jeff Bezos, that's, uh, yeah, it, we can just leave that one in the room like that. And uh, in the same way, I think there's a question in terms of nations, there's a question to be asked around subcontracting. I think this is a general question for also the gig economy and formal and informal economy. I mean, contracts are absent then, but the point is, you know, around should subcontracting be allowed and also um, should, what kind of contracts, what is a, you know, zero hour contract, should this be allowed? Because we don't have zero hour contracts in Germany, but then you have them in Poland. And again, they're serving the German market. So there's something to be said there because if workers are striking in Germany, we know who's shipping the products. So this all, again, then has implications on one another. Um, and I think, of course, when it comes to the gig economy, you're not going to get around the fact that they need to be reclassified and recognized as workers in the first place. Mm -hmm. And here we also come, go back to the informal economy. And uh, yeah, we have to build that foundation first um, to guard also just uh, not just wages. I mean, wages, obviously, because they protect our livelihoods, but also the rights that are there. And, you know, these are rights that have been struggled for for several uh, decades and centuries. And uh with the gig economy, we've seen this uh, deregulation of the labor market and celebration thereof, and uh, it's, uh, it's important to fight back against that. Thank you. Um, maybe to pick up from the question on policy recommendations, um, let's take this question from 
Zhao Ma or Max Ma, um, who asks, one assessment has been that big corporation-based economic systems are eating away um, at democracy in the sense that they increasingly control the legislative and electoral processes and outcomes. With regards to this perspective, how can regular people overturn this trend if democratic and legislative institutions are no longer reliable or trustworthy tools for inducing change? That's a pretty big question. That is a big question. <laughs> um, honestly, I think this goes back to sort of uh, everyone's individual perception of uh, their own agency and uh, their perception of change and how change is, uh, is pursued, kind of going back to your question with like, where do I see myself with the forming solidarity or what is my role as a researcher? And for myself, I've identified that, you know, change is also important by having precisely these spaces where we can take also what we've learned from workers and spreading the word. Like if it's the case of Amazon warehouse workers, they say, you know what, Amazon is saying it's the most customer centric uh, company in the world. So the most important thing is to let the customers know actually what's happening because the customers are the ones that have the highest power against Amazon because you're treated better as a customer than you are as a worker. So I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of different because Amazon and platforms have this huge ecosystem that holds implications, not just for the platform economy, but the labor market at large. There's so many different points at which we can we can start to push for that change. And that change can look like helping each other out online to best navigate a, a, a platform, but that change can also look like, um, you know, a grassroots union when, you know, and we've seen in the platform economy when a structure, an institution is absent with which workers identify, workers will find it themselves and they will create it themselves and they will grow it themselves. So, um, I think in the end of the day, it goes back to uh, what is our understanding of change and how we want to achieve it. That's great. Um, so we have, we have. I think we're on the last minute, but we can take another question. If that's another question, because I feel like there's been like different comments where you sort of like hinted at some like the international or like the global like ramifications. And I guess you, you started with the thing of dialectics where like one thing changes another thing. So when you said, like, for example, when Germany goes on strike, we know who's shipping this, like the warehouse, warehouse workers in Poland, right? So I guess maybe if you could just say a little bit about, like, how you think about your project as global in a way and how, like, one, what is a really hard question, <laughs> but how for one form of agency somewhere kind of creates one for, like, pushes alienation elsewhere because it's, I don't know, how do you tackle that? One form of agency pushes alienation elsewhere what yeah like that? the sense that like striking in germany then you know is, is like poland now is where the work is being conducted i think if we were to understand it as dialectical it would also mean that workers are then pushing back against that alienation and that's what we've seen with poland and germany actually it was the workers themselves that realized they were being used as strike breakers because when amazon when germany in germany workers went on strike amazon workers had to work extra hours and they put two and two together and that's how they started their communication between germany and poland and actually now when they develop tactics for example if they're going to strike in germany a way to like it's very fascinating to to listen to workers they will say okay we're going to choose a polish holiday mm -hmm. to make sure that we can actually like hit amazon where it matters the most and this is where in the end also when we're looking at unions no one knows Amazon better than the workers themselves. So in terms of finding strategies, that's where we start. And I think how I understand myself in terms of the global, I think one thing always starts with like, who are you as a researcher? And uh, in a way, your own subjectivity. Also, you add that gla those glasses when you approach the research itself, your understanding of solidarity, your understanding of, I mean, we're all located in our own, you know, conditions of uh, also historically what our labor struggles have looked like. And I think uh, that can expand the way we think of uh, agency and of resistance. And uh, if anything, workers time and time again say Amazon is a global corporation. And that's why also the labor movement needs to be global. And that's why the unions are really pushing for, uh, there's this one, Sorry, there's this one map I showed here, um, this bottom one. And this one is actually, um, they had a Make Amazon Pay campaign. 
And this shows where workers were uh, forming solidarity and protesting together on the same day. And you see it's across the world. Uh, of course, there's a gap in some places, but we can see it's in the global north and in the global south and that workers are forming solidarity in a way because Amazon is an international corporation. So you're seeing those expansions. So as also platforms are expanding, you know, I think it was Beverly Silver who said wherever capital goes, uh, labor struggles will follow. And we've seen this. Thank you so much. This was such an incredible talk and um, we're so happy to have had you here to tell us more about your book. I'll just hand it over back to you in case you want to say any closing words. Um, I just like to thank you all for coming and thank you for uh, for the questions. You know, they give me so much the questions around your role as a researcher and the positionality is just a constant process. You know, I'm saying probably if you ask me this question again next year, it will, you know, it will I will answer it differently. But uh, it's a process of reflection. And I think as researchers, we should also be honest with where we're at and what has informed this kind of research and through that, you know, we're also, as our research develops, so do we and vice versa. So thank you all very much. <laughs>